Um, welcome everybody to the second supporter session. Um, and I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully you'll, you'll all be able to see that once I go into presenter mode. Are you seeing the right one? I'm looking for a nodding head. Yeah. Okay, great. Cool. Okay, so thank you so much, guys, for, for giving up uh, an early afternoon um, or wherever you may be, um, the, the, the time zone that you might be in. Um, we want to run these supporter sessions really to be able to share and, and provide a bit of an insight into what we get up to, not only in the, in the organization, the charity that we, we work at, myself, Suzanne and Stuart, but also an opportunity for, for members and key people within the spinal cord injury research field to share their work and talk to us about it. Um, so we want to continue these, but it is important that, of course, you guys provide um, one, your participation, but also feedback on these so we can continue to improve these over time. So just bear those in mind as we go along. So I'm not going to talk for long because our main guest is going to be far more interesting than I. Um, but I will do what I will do is very quickly um, give you a brief um, reminder of who you who we are um, at Spinal Research. For those of you that that haven't been to one of these before, I will continue to drum uh, or bang this drum. Is that Spinal Research is the UK's leading medical research charity for research into spinal cord repair and restoration. A third of our staff have got a spinal cord injury and half of our board of trustees have a spinal cord injury or have got family members who do. So lived experience is really important to the way that we run the organization and makes a massive difference to the way that we go about our business uh, and how we prioritize our work. Um, very quickly, our vision, if you didn't already know, is to cure paralysis after spinal cord injury. Our mission is to catalyze and accelerate research and development so that we can deliver meaningful treatments to the spinal cord injury community. And our scope, our entire scope, is focused on repairing and restoring all functions. Um, so what have we been up to lately? So there's always lots of activity going on at the organization. We're really busy and working on various stages of the research pipeline. And um, I guess the most notable things that have happened in the last couple of months, I would say, is that in September, we had our annual network meeting where over 100 of the world's leading neuroscientists and clinicians come together, share their ideas, share their work, discuss, collaborate, form collaborations and, and partnerships, and, and really uh, allows um, you know, some of the brightest minds in the world to, to bang their heads together and come up with great new ideas that they can go away uh, and spend the next 12 months working on, on trying to find solutions for or building proposals for. Um, it's always in London every year and um, it's one of the most prestigious meetings. So only we can only accommodate a hundred or so scientists. So there's a lot of disappointed neuroscientists and clinicians who cannot attend this. It is also a closed meeting because a lot of the, uh, the data that is presented at these meetings is unpublished. And so uh, we get a really nice early glimpse into things that are coming along before they've had a chance to hit the press or hit the, hit the journals. Um, last month, we were really pleased to bring on board a brand new member of our team that is going to focus on something that we think is really, really important. So uh, for those of you that are based in the UK, um, uh, we feel in the UK that now is the right time to start preparing our clinical landscape for implementing all of the great science and, and research and development that is, is happening, not only in the UK, but also abroad. And so in order to do that, we need to make sure that our spinal units, our major trauma centers are all geared up and ready to start um, being research active. And so Shadia's new role essentially is a clinical research network manager, and she is going to be driving that work. So we're really excited to have her on board. And um, the aim is for um, all of the spinal units in the UK, so 11 of them, plus the major trauma centers to be engaged in this network 
and that this should be yielding new projects, new initiatives and clinical trials for spinal cord injury. If you speak to your consultants, make sure that they know about this network and that they are participating. It's important that everyone does, um, but we'll, we'll certainly be promoting uh, this a bit more over the coming weeks. And excitingly, uh, we just had our board meeting last week and we've agreed to fund three brand new projects, um, all of them UK based. Um, two of the projects are focusing on the role of plasticity in respiratory or breathing circuitry. Um, and the other is uh, an electrical stimulation uh, project for, for bowel and bladder uh, outcomes that's going to be at Stanmore, uh, the London Spinal Injury Centre. So these are this is hot off the press. Um, there will be some announcements soon, so you'll learn more about those projects. But it's really exciting that we are able to uh, to fund these and um, add another three projects to our portfolio of work, trying to bring and catalyze more research here in the UK. Um, I've just done a quick slide on some of the things that have been happening, which you may or may not have seen hit the headlines over time. So um, I won't take any questions on these at the moment, but if, if, you, if you want to ask questions around those and I'm able to answer them, take them to the Q&A at the end, please. So um, just winding back to the, um, to the early summer uh, or late spring, um, there was the big news that hit the BBC, Sky and every other news outlet probably across the world, um, whereby um, our colleagues over in Switzerland, in Lausanne, at EPFL, demonstrated a proof of principal pilot with a wireless brain spine interface. Um, so this was uh, the use or the integration of three technologies, a brain implant, um, a spine implant, and obviously then a a relay or an interface between the two. And um, this, this single person, single subject was shown to have improved coordination, uh, strength of function in his lower limbs um, as a result of using this technology. Um, so it was a really interesting uh, case. It is only one subject and also the first time that these three technologies have been put together like this to achieve this kind of outcome. So a really interesting start for this type of technologies. Um, more recently, just a, a month and a half ago, um, a biotech company called NerveGen um, announced that it's starting and has started dosing already um, a, in its phase 1B and 2A clinical trial. Um, this is based in Chicago. So this peptide is going to be uh, applied and, and the outcomes that they're going to be looking at are motor function. And um, for the chronic spinal cord injury cohort of this study, it will be for cervical injuries. So they'll be looking at upper extremity outcomes with this. Um, another piece of work, again, that was just very recent uh, recently hitting the headlines is is more of a, a, a let's say a, an early translation or possibly you know, could even class this as basic science finding where the group at EPFL, Dr. Mark Anderson, NeuroRestore was able to show with a combination therapy that they were able to stimulate a very specific type uh, of, of neuron across a very severe injury in a, in a mouse and guide those nerves to their targets to restore some function. So it was really exciting to see a combination being used in this way, um, but of course, a lot of work to do that goes between a, a mouse and a, and a human, of course. So those were three recent highlights. Uh, there are, of course, many more, but I just pulled out the ones that perhaps made the most noise. Um, I'm sure if you guys have got any others that, that can come on your desk, please do reach out to us and we're happy to, to have a look at those and, and respond accordingly. So with that, I'm going to now hand you over to our main speaker. So that's Dr. Christopher West or Chris West. He's an associate professor at UBC Department of Cellular and Physiological Sciences and ICORD, which is the International Collaboration Repair Discoveries, which is in Vancouver, Canada. He is a Brit and I will squeeze that in. 
um, uh, just as being patriotic there, of course. But I'm going to hand that over now to Christopher. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing there. Leave it to you, Chris. Great. Thank you so much, Harvey. And uh, thanks very much to, for the foundation for organizing this. I'm excited to uh, share some of the work that we've been running out of my lab and uh, just checking everyone can see this okay and uh, I'll get started. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today really is, a, I'll give you a bit of a brief overview about myself and how I got into spinal cord injury and then talk over some of the changes that happen within the cardiovascular system, autonomic nervous system, respiratory system, and then uh, go through some of the um, ways in which we're trying to target these pathways and functions to essentially improve quality of life and independence for people living with spinal cord injury. Um, <clears throat> so with that, I, uh, as Harvey said, I'm a, a Brit. I uh, started my education pretty much in the University of Essex, uh, doing human applied exercise physiology and performance. Um, after I left my undergrad, I uh, went and worked in industry, uh, still at a university, trying to develop sports opportunities at first. And then um, after that, worked as a clinical exercise physiologist, vowing never, go, never to go back to university again. Um, but fast forward a few years and uh, some nice opportunities came up to further my education. So uh, from 2007 to 2011, I completed both my master's degree and PhDs. Uh, at the University of Brunel in West London. And uh, my whole PhD focused on uh, spinal cord injury and in particular, um, looking at respiratory and cardiovascular function. Once I finished my PhD, I uh, made the move over to i which is, a, for those that don't know, is a spinal cord injury research center located in Vancouver in Canada. Uh, first, I was a postdoctoral research fellow there, uh, working with Andre Krasikov, and then subsequent to that, I've been running my, my own research lab. Um, so my research lab now focuses on um, trying to understand and treat both acute and chronic cardiovascular, respiratory, and autonomic uh, challenges and functions after spinal cord injury. I do this uh, across a range of different ways. We have some very experimental therapies that we test out in animal models of spinal cord injury. And then a lot of work with the um, patient and acute patient population with spinal cord injury out to people living in the community. And uh, actually a lot of work with elite athletes who uh, have a spinal cord injury as well. My lab is actually split across two different locations, um, but both located in British Columbia and Canada. So how did I get into this? It's, uh, you know, I, I'm not, you know, fortunately for me, I'm not one of those people that, you know, has been afflicted by spinal cord injury or, or none of my family have. But when I started my master's degree, a really interesting and exciting opportunity came along to work with the Great Britain wheelchair rugby squad. And so I essentially became uh, an exercise physiologist working with the uh, GB wheelchair rugby for four, four or five years. And um I didn't really know anything about spinal cord injury when I started working with them. And uh, yeah, I, I learned so much from those individuals. And I really became, I guess, intrigued and interested in, in the cardiovascular and respiratory systems after spinal cord injury. And so what I'm showing on the bottom here is essentially the first data I ever collected back in 2008 in, in people with a spinal cord injury. And so on the left there, you'll see some different color lines that are colored by classification in wheel wheelchair rugby. And this was a really simple test. We just had uh, these individuals that form different classifications in wheelchair rugby. So 0.5 is the lowest classification, three is the highest classification or most functional. Um, and we just asked these individuals to do arm exercise and gradually increase the resistance on that arm exercise. And we were just measuring heart rate. So really quite, quite straightforward. And essentially what we found is that heart rate really didn't go up very much. And, you know, I, I came from a background in exercise physiology and I can really couldn't understand this when I started working this population. I thought I thought something was wrong with my um, measurement techniques or the the heart rate monitors that I was using because the heart rate really went only went up to about 100 to 115 beats per minute. And if you compare that to an able bodied individual, maximum heart rate is usually somewhere between 160 to 200. 
And so this really got me interested in some of the underlying physiology of spinal cord injury. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do in the first part of this talk is, uh, I guess, highlight some of the ways that we now understand that the cardiovascular, respiratory and autonomic nervous system changes after spinal cord injury. Um, as I say, I got into this through the lens of exercise performance and applied exercise physiology, but we've subsequently been going, going down to try and understand some of the mechanisms behind these changes. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide because I think this is one of the most important of the presentation. And so if we think about the organization of the nervous system, you know, much like we need nerves coming from the brain to the lower part of the spinal cord to control legs or the upper part of the spinal cord to control arms, it's the same with pretty much all organs through the body. Those organs are part of a, a slightly different nervous system known as the autonomic nervous system. Um, and then the respiratory system as well is really affected depending on where the level of injury occurs in the spinal cord. So from the respiratory side, as, uh, as I'm sure most of you on this call know, um, the main muscle of respiration is your diaphragm. So this is what helps you to breathe in. And most people breathe out just by relaxation of the diaphragm. And the nerves that control the diaphragm exit the spinal cord really quite high in the neck. And so for most individuals living in the community, um, th these nerves are still intact, i.e. the injury would occur somewhere below this point. If the injury occurs above this point, then usually some kind of intervention such as diaphragm pacing or um, the need for, for chronic ventilation is there because the diaphragm would be paralyzed. So what I'm going to talk about today is when injury occurs below this point. So everybody would be able to breathe uh, relatively well on their own. As we go down into the thoracic spinal cord, then the muscles that help us to breathe out, that's where they get their innovation from. And so almost with any level of spinal cord injury, there can be some impairment in expiratory function. And this usually manifests as things such as impaired cough, or if you're trying to breathe out very fast during exercise. <clears throat> um, now, what about this other nervous system, this autonomic nervous system? So this is a nervous system that is, is kind of just there. It just functions. We don't really have to think about this um, in order for it to function. And really, it's comprised of two sets of nerves. One here known as this parasympathetic nervous system or the rest and digest. This is responsible for slowing down heart rate um, and helping to digest food. The nerves that control this system arise out of the brainstem. And so with any level of spinal cord injury, these nerves remain fully intact and under control. The other part of the nervous system is what we call the sympathetic nervous system shown here in green. These nerves exit the spinal cord, starting in the thoracic spinal cord. They go to the heart, they go to the, the blood vessels in our body, uh, both the upper limbs and the lower limbs. This nervous system is what we class as our fight and flight response. So it increases heart rate and increases blood pressure. Now a challenge is, is when, the, when a spinal cord injury occurs above this region, so somewhere around C6, C7, C8, then the control over those nerves is lost. And so there can be a number of challenges with a lot of different organs in the body because the control over the nerves doesn't, is no longer present from the brainstem. And so this is really a, a key topic in the field. And, and this is why really autonomic cardiovascular and respiratory function after spinal cord injury can be so different person to person um, because it's really dependent on both the level of injury and how complete or severe that injury is. <clears throat> so one of the key concepts, and, and this was something I really wasn't aware of when I started in the field, is that if you have a spinal cord injury, you have a disruption just to that nerve that comes down, down the spinal cord from the brain. The nerves that exit the spinal cord below here shown in blue, these nerves are all still fully in, fully present. So the nerve from the spinal cord out to here and from, from the periphery out to the organs, this is intact. And what we actually now understand is that, is that these nerves undergo remarkable plasticity or changes after spinal cord injury. And there's a lot of research now focusing on how we can, I guess, start to regain some control over these nerves. And uh, many labs have shown this, we, we've done the same. Um, if you actually take sections of the spinal cord and this has been done across um, humans and animal models as well, and you actually look for these nerves in the spinal cord, you can still find them present after injury. They're the ones shown in the box here. This would just be a cross section of the spinal cord 
and you can um, stain or color these nerves uh, in different colors, and then you can find their presence after spinal cord injury. So we now know these nerves are present, uh, and some interventions, which I'll talk about later today, are starting to target these nerves with a, with a view to trying to improve cardiovascular autonomic function. But before we get there, I thought I would try and put in a, a British specific example of, uh, of how this really works. And, you know, I grew up in and around Cambridge and I used to make the journey down to as a clinical exercise physiologist down to London each day. Um, so, you know, I'd start here and I, I would make my way down to London. <clears throat> I'm sure many of you recognize this place. This is uh, London Stansted Airport and uh, it has a history of closing down and Ryanair causing problems here. And when this happens, it essentially backs traffic all the way back up here. And then traffic backs up all the way up the M11 and it can't get through down to London. And this is essentially the concept of what happens with, with nerve impulses after spinal cord injury. You have your control centers, i.e. the brain of the country, which is Cambridge in this case, where I grew up. Um, and, then, uh, and then that part is still functioning, but the nerves just don't make it, the, the impulses don't make it down the spinal cord. So with that, I'm gonna move on and just uh, summarize uh, some of the areas that we've been studying in my lab and some of the changes that we find in some of the different organ systems after spinal cord injury. So I'm gonna start by focusing on the heart, which is one of the, the main uh, organs that I focus on. We can measure this really nicely. Um, uh, I should also say as well, I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna share some data from mostly from uh, uh, patient or chronic uh, or individuals with chronic spinal cord injury I will also share some work that is more experimental on animal models. So I've included kind of a key in the, in the top right corner here. So if you see this sign here, this means any data that I'm sharing is collected from um, humans living with spinal cord injury. So in terms of the heart, we're really fortunate. We can image this very easily using ultrasound and we can view the four chambers of the heart and make measurements of the size. And uh, there's been around 30 studies that encompasses about 500 to 600 people with spinal cord injury. And uh, we recently summarized a lot of the data from those. And essentially what we find here is able-bodied individuals on the left is spinal cord injury, that the size of the heart actually gets a little smaller after high level spinal cord injury. And this can be expressed in any of these different measurements, but they're all essentially a little lower in people with spinal cord injury. Not very much, but about 10 to 15%. In terms of blood pressure, um, and if any of you on the call have a cervical spinal cord injury, I'm, I'm sure you're more than aware of this, um, but individuals with cervical uh, spinal cord injury tend to have lower resting blood pressure, again, because the, the nerve impulses coming from the brain down the spinal cord aren't making it to the circuits that go out to control the blood vessels. And so this is, again, a summary. Every gray dot here is a different study, and then this would just be the average across those studies of individuals with cervical, high thoracic, low thoracic lumbar injury and able-bodied individuals. And what you can really see here again, similar to that first diagram I showed is that the higher the level of spinal cord injury, and once it's in the cervical cord, there are some real challenges just even with, with maintaining blood pressure at rest. As you go down the spinal cord, blood pressure control becomes more, more normal. And that's because the nerves that control the blood vessels are now back in, in connection with the, with the cardiovascular control center in the brainstem. Heart rate, again, similar thing, similar pattern. Same graph here, gray dots uh, represent individual studies, and then the black is the, the mean and average across all of those. So we find a similar thing for both blood pressure and heart rate, that it's a little lower after spinal cord injury. Um, and this can be particularly... Um, challenging from an independence perspective for people with spinal cord injury because it can manifest as low blood pressure in the morning or after someone eats a meal um, and this can uh, I guess cause challenges with things like lightheadedness um, and feeling faint. There's also some uh, some changes that happen in the brain blood vessels. This is always a little hard to, to kind of uh, understand because the brain is obviously above the level of the spinal cord, but the nerves that control the blood vessels in the brain, again, they're part of the sympathetic nervous system, so they don't exit the spinal cord till quite low. Now, one easy way that we can assess brain blood flow is just to ask somebody to close their eyes. We're again using ultrasound here to measure blood flow. 
And then when we ask someone to open the eyes, brain blood flow goes up. So the red here is just a, a stylized value from our able-bodied group. And if you look at someone with spinal cord injury, there's really not much of an increase in brain blood flow um, when eyes are open. And again, some of the manifestations from an independence perspective or the way this would, what this might cause is, uh, is things like um, finding it hard to concentrate. And, and some studies have looked at uh, cognition and cognitive function and tried to correlate these changes as well. Okay, so that's some of the changes in the organs. I'm gonna talk about blood pressure control a little more here because there's two, um, I guess, changes that happen in the control of blood pressure that are un very unique to people with spinal cord injury. Um, and one of those is autonomic dysreflexia. I'm sure many of you are aware of this. Now, autonomic dysreflexia essentially describes um, a high blood pressure episode that can't be compensated for until whatever the cause of the dysreflexia is, is removed. The way dysreflexia causes high blood pressure is that um, usually something like a, a bowel or bladder distension or a full bladder or full bowel um, stimulates nerves that go back to the spinal cord. And those nerves um, essentially travel up the spinal cord just a little way where they activate those nerves that are going to the blood vessels. Again, remembering that these nerve pathways, they're still fully intact after spinal cord injury. As blood pressure goes up, it is sensed by the body. This is all still intact here. It goes back into the brain where it's sensed. And then the brain tries to send signals down the spinal cord to inhibit or prevent this uh, activation in the lower spinal cord. But because of the injury, those signals don't get through. And so what you essentially end up with is, is just this reflex occurring in the lower part of the spinal cord where some kind of stimuli is activating the nerves that are going out to the blood vessels, causing them to constrict. And so really the only treatment for autonomic dysreflexia is to try and identify what the cause is and remove that cause. This is, uh, can be a very dangerous clinical condition. And, and for those that are involved in uh, sport, people can also try and use this condition as a way to try and boost their blood pressure during exercise, which also comes with some dangers as well. <clears throat> Over time, what we still don't really understand is if people suffer really bad dysreflexia, are there any changes that occur in the blood vessels because you get this constriction happening so often? And that's something that is, is being actively researched in the field right now. On the other end of the spectrum is something called orthostatic hypotension. So this describes episodes of low blood pressure particularly when changing position. So this could be moving from supine to seated or from seated into a standing frame, for example. And uh, we've done many tests on this in the lab over the years. And uh, what would normally happen is, is something like this. The green line here is an able-bodied individual. So you would start laying down, you'd ask that person to sit up and that individual is able to maintain their blood pressure. If you look at someone with a cervical or high thoracic spinal cord injury, it's a really, I guess, mixed bag of responses. Some of these individuals exhibit a drop in blood pressure that can actually, you know, maintain blood pressure at this lower value without there really being any clinical signs. And then other individuals, as soon as you ask them to sit up, um, their blood pressure drops off very quickly. And this individual, in fact, fainted during the, during the test. And we laid them back down again and everything was fine. And so again, some, some real challenges here with the control of blood pressure. And most of this can all be traced back to because of that impairment in the control of those nerves going to the blood vessels. Okay, so moving away from the autonomic system and just highlighting the, the respiratory system, we see a very similar trend in the respiratory system to the autonomic nervous system. So this is just colored by broad levels of injury looking at measures of respiratory function, and uh, we're expressing these as percent predicted. So this color here would be individuals with a C4 to C5 injury. These individuals are C6 to C8 injury, T1 to T6 spinal level injury, and T7 to L3 spinal injury. The two over here represent um, how well people are able to breathe out and the flow and the speed at which the air comes out. And as you can see, um, perhaps not too surprising now with the rest of the talk is that the higher the level of the injury, the more there can be an impairment in these indices. Does this cause any challenges with daily life? 
probably not. But when you try to challenge the system during exercise, then the ability of this system to respond is not as effective in someone with a higher level of injury. So it can have some knock on consequences from performing exercise. And then here, this last one over here is really a measure of expiratory muscle strength. And as I said at the start, um, with that other figure showing where the nerves that control the expiratory muscles are, um, there's really an impairment in this index in pretty much every single level of spinal cord injury, because with any level of spinal cord injury, the nerves that control the expiratory muscles are interrupted to varying degrees. So that's really some changes in the, in the resting function. <clears throat> and as I say, for, for most people living with spinal cord injury, this, or these challenges with heart, brain, blood pressure control, don't have too many daily consequences, except perhaps autonomic dysreflexia and orthostatic hypotension. But where we really see some of these effects start to take or to manifest is when we ask people with spinal cord injury to exercise. And so this is something I've studied for a long time in the lab and, and trying to understand all the way back to that original heart rate figure, how exercise responses change after injury and what the downstream impacts of this might be from long-term cardiovascular disease um, and independence. And so this was some work of a PhD student of mine. And essentially what we asked people to do is just exercise against greater and greater resistance on an arm crankogometer. And we just traced what's called oxygen uptake. You can think of this as a measure of fitness or how much oxygen the body can take in and use. This dotted line represents able-bodied individuals and this uh, black line here represents cervical spinal cord injury. And uh, at the very low levels of exercise here, there's really not too many differences, but as you start to go through exercise, uh, these individuals with cervical spinal cord injury were unable to uptake and utilize oxygen as much. And much of this comes down to the fact that blood pressure isn't going up, heart rate isn't going up, and uh, blood delivery to the working muscles isn't going up. So you can't get oxygen to the working muscles. And so I think this is really um, where some of the effects of spinal cord injury are, are seen in the clearest. And I think this is part of the reason um, why we're starting to find now, you know, Surgery and acute care of spinal cord injury has got so much better. And, uh, you know, people with spinal cord injury um, uh, are living remarkably good and, and long lives. But we are starting to see now that cardiovascular disease is more prevalent in individuals with spinal cord injury than able-bodied individuals. And in fact, this is something that has been has been tracked now through a number of studies. Um, this is some work from i -Cord, um, just looking at risks for long-term cardiovascular disease in, in people living with spinal cord injury um, for 30, 40, 50 years. And, uh, and what we see here is if we look at what we scientists call odds ratios or just the chance of getting either heart disease or stroke, the chance of this is about four to five times higher with high level spinal cord injury than it is in individuals that don't have a spinal cord injury. And, uh, and this, now we understand this a little better. Um, we're now trying to really work on, uh, on new ways to try and treat this with a long-term health and independence perspective. So what are some of the, the traditional, I guess, treatments for cardiovascular disease or, or trying to not really treatments, but trying to manage long-term cardiovascular disease and reduce risk? It's pretty much been the same um, for people with spinal cord injury as it has with uh, able-bodied individuals. And that is that individuals with spinal cord injury should engage in uh, various forms of physical activity and exercise, uh, just like able-bodied individuals should to try and offset risk. But as I've just shown, um, you know, for those with high spinal cord injury, some of the, there are some challenges unique to those individuals that perhaps means that exercise isn't as effective. And can we do anything in the acute setting to mitigate this? We really don't know. There's really been no studies that I'm aware of that have looked at various acute management interventions with a long-term cardiovascular disease risk in mind. Um, so this is some work I did with my colleague, Kathleen Martin-Guinness, uh, where we actually looked at implementing an intervention that is done according to the physical activity guidelines for people with spinal cord injury. So we essentially uh, asked individuals with high or low level spinal cord injury to engage in physical activity uh, for at least three days a week. We allocated them either to a control group or an intervention group. 
you don't need to look at the the specific specifics of this, but just know we had about thirty individuals uh, engage in this exercise intervention, which lasted for twelve lasted for twelve weeks, and then we made measures in those that went through the exercise uh, intervention. For those interested, the exercise intervention was a personalized physical activity intervention. We had weekly coaching and personal training sessions, and it was a way to encourage people to incorporate physical activity into daily life. So this wasn't coming into a gym, gymnasium and performing exercises. This was really working with the individual to um, help them incorporate activity in any way, shape, or form that they were able to. And uh, we measured fitness before and after. And uh, if we look at everybody that took part in the physical activity intervention, we found that those that completed the 12 week intervention had improved fitness, which was great. And uh, those that didn't take in part into the intervention did not see that change. So we were pretty confident that the physical activity intervention worked from improving a fitness perspective. So then we also made some measurements of the cardiovascular system to try and look at cardiovascular risk profiling. And uh, I'm gonna split this here by level of injury. So let me orientate you to the graph. On the, on the left here, we've got individuals that have a high spinal cord injury above the, the T6 spinal level. And these are um, measures of uh, heart function, which we made via ultrasound. And disappointingly, what we found is that in those that have high level injury, any metric of heart function that we try to, to look at really wasn't improving in the in either the physical activity group and was was remaining unchanged in the control group. Whereas uh, individuals that had a low level spinal cord injury, they exhibited the changes in heart function that we would expect to see with exercise, much like able bodied individuals do. And so again, I, th I think you know, there was no difference in how much physical activity people with high versus low level did. So I think this really emphasizes again, how important re-engaging some of those um, sympathetic nerves might be to help promote a more efficacious cardiovascular response to exercise. So take home from this is that the exercise worked well for everybody. Everybody was able to improve fitness, um, but only those with low injury were able to improve I guess, risk for cardiovascular disease. So this raises the question really, and, and something my lab focuses on is, well, what can we do for the high injuries? And I think the clue comes back to some of this, you know, anatomy of how the sympathetic nervous system is organized. So if you remember from this figure, if we have an injury here, the, the um, nerve impulses don't make it down the spinal cord to control this circuit. So this circuit essentially becomes low in activity, but these nerves are still very much there, remember. So I, I think this represents an opportunity for the field that we've perhaps not really been focusing on. And so what I'm gonna do now is share some of the, um, the interventions that we've been working on that try and help targeting these pathways in, in ultimately in individuals with high level spinal cord injury. The view here or the goal is to try and activate these pathways so that we would be able to restore the normal cardiovascular um, response to exercise and help to mitigate long-term cardiovascular disease, prevent things like orthostatic hypotension and autonomic dysreflexia, and therefore enhance independence among people living with spinal cord injury. So there's two approaches that I'm gonna talk about today. One, we term neuroprotection, and this is really a very acute strategy. I'll just highlight one project we're working on, and then I'll talk a little bit more about this. And this is what um, my lab's been fortunate to receive some funding from ISRT on is, is how can we modulate this circuitry in, in the chronic setting of spinal cord injury. So in this acute setting, um, and this is some work done in, uh, in large animal models with Professor Brian Kwan at UBC, we, are, a, we um, are able to make some, I guess, some more invasive measures of what's happening in and around the injury site of the spinal cord. And our real goal with this project is to try and find ways where we can better enhance blood flow and oxygen delivery to the area of the spinal cord that has been injured. And we know that if we can preserve blood flow and oxygen delivery to that area, then we can protect that initial injury from expanding any further over the next one to two weeks. And if we're able to do that, we can uh, preserve more injuries coming down to the spinal cord. Um, okay, and then moving now into uh, into focusing on the the chronic setting. Um, 
So in this scenario, I'm going to talk about two interventions. One of this is uh, epidural stimulation or, or stimulation of the spinal cord. Um, and in this, people with spinal cord injury uh, get implanted with a electrical array over the, the surface of the spinal cord. And then these electrodes effectively can be activated. And so what we did in an individual, one individual with cervical spinal cord injury that had been implant, implanted with this array is we asked them just to lay down and then we tilted the bed upright. And this would cause a reduction in blood pressure or the, or the demonstration of orthostatic hypotension. And what we found remarkably is when we turn the stimulator on just acutely, there was an immediate restoration or prevention of that drop in blood pressure with the stimulation. When we measured blood flow into the brain, same thing, brain blood flow would drop with a tilt, but if we tilt with the stimulator on, then, um, then we can prevent that reduction in blood flow. And just here on the right-hand side, um, what we found is that if you just measure resting blood pressure and you turn the stimulator on, you can actually maintain blood pressure for long periods of time with this. So this was some really quite exciting um, uh, preliminary data demonstrating that if you can directly activate those circuits, you can help to control the cardiovascular system. And then I'm going to spend the last little bit of the talk here talking about a, a new therapy that we've been working on in the, in the lab. And uh, this is a therapy called intermittent hypoxia. Um, so in this, we ask people to breathe low levels of oxygen just for a very short period of time, around 45 seconds to a minute. It's about 10% oxygen. So that's still plenty of oxygen. There's going to be no de detrimental effects. If you were to climb Mount Everest, the amount of oxygen there is, is far lower. Um, and what we're finding, or certainly what other people in the field are finding, is that if you repetitively breathe low oxygen, it becomes a stimulus that is sensed here, can go back to the brain, and it can cause activation of the, of the, the brain circuitry. And so there's been many studies on intermittent hypoxia to try and recover function of the circuits that are still intact below the injury. But some really exciting data has come out showing that actually um, when you breathe low oxygen, the spinal cord itself can sense the low oxygen. And so this got me thinking that, well, if the spinal cord itself can you know, sense this low oxygen, then it can be a way to activate the, the circuits that are controlling the heart and blood vessels. And so what we've been looking at now is actually making some direct measures of, of nerve recordings um, from the nerves that uh, control blood pressure. And so this is what we call sympathetic nerve recordings. Uh, this is some experimental work in an animal model, but we reduce oxygen content down. And you can see you get some really nice activation of the sympathetic nervous system. But what's really apparent is that if you look at this black line, this is where the activity of that nervous system is um, at baseline. And then following the hypoxia, you get some really nice continued activation of this nervous system, even though the hypoxia has disappeared. And this hangs around for about two, three, maybe four hours, maybe even 12 hours. And so we've started to ask the question, well, if, you know, if we can just breathe low oxygen and it activates these nerves, what happens to things like cardiovascular function? And so in a follow-up study, we've been able to characterize this increase in nerve activity now. This doesn't happen if, if you don't breathe the hypoxia. And then if you just look at something simple like blood pressure, we found that blood pressure was able to go up very consistently um, following the delivery of the hypoxia. So again, the hypoxia is stopped, um, just back to breathing normal air, and blood pressure is able to be increased. Now, this was just a single episode of the hypoxia. What happens if you do this repetitively for, for at least two, three weeks? Well, we were able to answer this in a, a, another experimental study where we um, essentially exposed animals to low levels of oxygen, again, just for 45 seconds at a time. And then we measured blood pressure just resting after this had been done. And we were able to find that at daily intermittent hypoxia was able to restore some level of blood pressure control. Um, so this has been really exciting to us and, uh, and intermittent hypoxia, for those that don't know, is, is already approved for clinical use. And there are a number of clinical studies focusing on this therapy for the recovery, mostly of respiratory function after, after spinal cord injury. But re we really think this, uh, that this therapy can also be extended to look at recovery of cardiovascular function as well. So with that, I'm just going to summarize and then happy to 
uh, to answer any questions. Um, so hopefully what I've been able to show you up here is, or and to highlight is that spinal cord injury, certainly when it happens in, in the, the higher part of the spinal cord, changes some of the normal control over the autonomic nervous system, the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system. <clears throat> Increase in physical activity uh, and taking part in exercise has many benefits, including improving cardiovascular function and risk in those with low level of injury. For high injuries, we probably need to have a bit of a rethink here. And, you know, exercise has, has so many benefits from a, from a psychosocial engagement community building that I, I would never not tell people to exercise for sure. And that should not be the message here. Um, for sure, exercise is still good. But I think perhaps that, you know, we can think of more clever ways that we can use exercise, perhaps in combination with some of these, these newer interventions that, that directly activate these circuits. Um, and that perhaps something with a combination may be best. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the funding sources uh, that have uh, supported some of the work, um, my lab, and uh, I've been fortunate to have some really good mentors along the way as well. And uh, yeah, thanks to all of you for coming and listening and, uh, for, and to ISRT for, for hosting this. Uh, I think these events are really great. And yeah, thanks so much, everyone. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Chris. That was amazing. Um, be so before we get to the Q and A, um, Suzanne, do you want to just quickly um, kind of speak to a couple of bits, and then we can get on to the absolutely questions. So let me just share I... the screen so you can. Fantastic. Talk. Thank you, Harvey. No worries. Uh, just checking that you can all see this again. Yeah, Suzanne. Yep. Can see the screen. It's on Dr. Christopher West at the moment. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, um, mm. that was absolutely fascinating. I can't compete with that, but um, <laughs> I just wanted to um, have the opportunity to introduce myself and tell you about a few ways that you can get involved with spinal research. Um, so my name is Suzanne and I'm Community Fundraising Manager at Spinal Research. Um, and so, yes, as mentioned, um, research into spinal cord injury is very much driven by our community. Um, that community is made up of supporters with spinal cord injuries, their friends, their families, their colleagues, and so on. And it's with the support of this community that we can speed up the discovery of treatments and move closer to curing paralysis. Um, so there's quite a few different ways you can get involved. Um, so the first um, is sharing. So sharing um, our progress, the content that we share um, on social media channels via our connections, newsletters or monthly newsletters. Um, so sharing them on where well, as, as in any way you can on your social media channels and just in your uh, with your local contacts. Um, the second is participate. Um, so again, that's just kind of sharing and spreading the word of what we do, but also we do have opportunities for you to um, engage with us a bit further. So you might want to share your story with us and tell us um, kind of your spinal cord injury journey, but also we have lots of other ways you can participate. So it might be that you've got an interest um, in getting involved in research trials. Um, so you can let us know and find out more on our website. And then lastly, um, fundraise. Um, if you could just go to the next slide, Harvey. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we would absolutely love um, for our supporters to be part of Team Spinal and fundraise for us. Um, fundraising is a really key part of supporting spinal research. Uh, we know that the science is there, but we do need the funding to make things happen. Um, so we are always here with really warm welcome guidance and support for anybody who wants to fundraise to push research forward. Um, so you might want to get involved, your family, your friends um, can get involved in so many different ways from taking on um, mad challenges to using your birthday to collect donations to organising your own fundraising events. Um, so I just thought I'd just draw your attention to a couple of things um, that you can get involved with at the moment. Um, so we have um, something called um, Share Your Hope, which is a online digital collage wall 
where you can share your message of hope for research um, and other people can see it. Um, we have um, Spinal Research Ambassadors who really are a group of people that are passionate about curing paralysis and they champion um, spinal research in their local area. Um, if you want to find out more about that role, I would love to hear from you. Um, and I also thought I should probably mention at this time of the year Christmas cards because we do have um, lots of Christmas cards for sale. So if you wanted to order some, go to our website and have a look. Um, and then I think lastly, we've got some different ways, sorry, <laughs> the different ways that you can stay connected with us. Um, so we do have a monthly email newsletter that goes out um, and that gives a really nice kind of overview of um, recent progress, um, research that's going on and maybe the chance to kind of find out a bit more about the different researchers. Um, and then we also have lots of ways you can follow us on social media. So um, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Um, if you do use those channels, we would love you to follow us and just keep up to date. Um, and yes, if anybody is interested in fundraising, I would absolutely love to hear from you. Um, so thank you. I'll pass on to you, Harvey, for Ooh, questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Suzanne. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I think obviously that was lots of great information uh, that, that Chris uh, and of course Suzanne shared and this is your opportunity to ask questions with no prejudice you, they can be as as wild or as 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 challenging as possible as you as you wish um we will try to answer them uh, as best we can and if we can't we will go and seek the right experts to come back and answer those for you so please don't be shy um put your hands up and and um ask questions please sanda I can see Hello. Hello. Hi. Thank you for, for this and apologies for being late. It's just my previous meeting overrun. And um and maybe this information has been shared, but I so question number one, what is considered high high injury in, in um, this context? In, in the context of what I study, we consider high yes. injury in, in any level of the cervical spinal cord. But if you ask somebody unfortunately everybody's going to probably give you a different answer to this because if you ask somebody that purely studies respiratory function after after spinal cord injury they will give you the answer that a high injury is an injury at c1 c2 c3 level of the spinal cord um right. and it you know many people would define high injury in a bit of a different way um depending on the the outcomes or the systems that they study my broad understanding of the field as a whole is that a high injury would be considered um, cervical, maybe the first upper, the, the first two upper thoracic segments, and then mid injury down to about the T10 level, and then a, a low spinal cord injury would be in the lumbar level of the spinal cord. So neck, mid back, low back, if you are trying to think about this, you know, on okay. you as a, yeah. Okay. Um no, it's 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 interesting because obviously when when I got injured eight years ago, um, obviously you know I I I have recollection of you know people are rushing to give you extra oxygen, which um is completely opposite of what what you've just told us. So how is your research being shared and and utilized on the ground? You know when people get injured and. And, and and the findings that you you are making how is that being applied in real life yeah so i i guess let me just clarify an important concept here the the intermittent hypoxia would never be delivered to somebody that is very newly injured because we in fact want to increase oxygen and blood flow to the spinal cord at the time of injury we definitely don't want to reduce it so I don't ever foresee this intermittent hypoxia therapy being used in the acute setting. And in fact, okay. all of the all of the work that I'm doing there is, as you said, it's the opposite. We're trying to trying to increase oxygen delivery to the spinal cord. Where we see the intermittent hypoxia working best is in in the chronic setting after spinal cord injury. So once you're out of that first year post spinal cord mm -hmm. injury, once some of the um 
initial changes that are happening in the spinal cord have settled down, then um, then the intermittent hypoxia seems to work really well in that setting. Um, and I guess think of intermittent hypoxia just as an easy way to activate the spinal cord. There's many mm -hmm. other ways that you could activate the spinal cord, but they're more, they require surgical interventions or stimulators. The intermittent hypoxia is nice because you could effectively just put a face mask on and, and breathe low oxygen for, for 30 to 45 seconds and okay. activate your spinal cord in the same way. So it's just, it's, it's essentially a non-invasive, what we would class a non-invasive way to, to activate the spinal cord for doesn't require some of the surgical interventions that things like the epidural stimulators or the spinal stimulators do require. Okay. So yeah. again, kind of what my question, so, okay. Um, so now we're out in the, in the community. Um, and this is probably where I think all, all the spinal injury owners would, would argue this is kind of where the whole system falls flat, flat on its face, um, where there aren't many, trained professionals um who who can deal with the number of people with spinal injuries um they're very you know few and far in between and then you know what you normally get is just you know box standard physio who's probably a little bit afraid because you're in a wheelchair so um you know information like this um how, how how's how's the findings in your knowledge how how, how, how can you reach them yeah. Um, shall I, shall I, I interject? I was just going to say, if you want to give yeah. the UK yeah, yeah, yeah. of this, Harvey, that's, that's probably you. So I can, I can tell you we're biggest, doing in Canada, but yeah. One of the biggest questions that we always have is how do we get, you know, how do we move these great findings into clinical practice? And of, of course, making those available to the community. And those are really important to us at Spinal Research. And, and unfortunately, it's not a straightforward answer we can give you, but what we can do is we can start to, um, make sure that we are preparing the landscape for adoption of these interventions. So we just touched upon things like epidural stimulation, spinal stimulation, intermittent hypoxia. Um, of course, one is you've got to get the clinical trials set up, run and, and approved. And then you've got to train clinical staff or, you know, let's say exercise physiologists um, that can deliver these interventions in a safe and appropriate place to the community. So there is work to do. The onus is on us as a community as well to be involved in that because um, it won't just land on our laps, pardon the pun. Um, so it's really important that we do we do um, bring a lot of awareness and attention to the fact that, you know, is our health care, our care pathways set up correctly to deliver these great interventions that are being developed further up the R&D pipeline. So probably doesn't give you the answer you're looking for, but I think here in the UK, what we're doing at the moment is trying to build a clinical trial network where the spinal injury centers, other centers that are doing rehabilitation, and of course the major trauma centers are mm -hmm. all participating and collaborating and partnering on bringing some of these interventions into the real world for us in the UK. So that's my, let's say, diplomatic answer. Chris, I don't know whether you want to add something to that. No, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, much the same. We uh, <clears throat> we actually just received some funding to start the clinical trial for looking at intermittent hypoxia for the recovery of cardiovascular function here in Canada. Um, so that is starting here in Canada. And, you know, again, focusing on that specifically, I, I know there are, in North America, there's at least 25, 26 trials currently registered looking at intermittent hypoxia across, you know, what we class as the model systems in North America, which is a collection of different um, spinal cord injury specific research centers um, and clinical centers that are starting to run these interventions. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, but we suffer much the same challenges, it, you know, in fact, if anything more, because British Columbia, the province where I work, is bigger than the UK on its own, let alone trying to get something out of our province. So it's it's hard to get that connectedness. So match the same challenges that Harvey outlined. May I come in with a, uh, a question, please? Absolutely. Um, the, I suffer from uh, sleep apnea um, mm -hmm. and uh, headaches and so on with that. It, might that actually, might sleep apnea be a good thing? 
Yeah, you know, I get this question quite a lot from people that have this. And uh, actually, there's a there's another one of my colleagues in the States uh, called Randy Trumbo, who is investigating exactly this, which is the interaction between whether you are uh, whether intermittent hypoxia works as a therapy, depending on if you do or don't have underlying sleep apnea. And what he's actually been able to show is that if, if you have severe sleep apnea, then intermittent hypoxia probably isn't for you. But actually for those that have uh, mild to moderate sleep apnea, then intermittent hypoxia is, is almost most effective in those individuals. And one of the reasons he thinks that's the case, and we're yet to study this because it's a very hard trial to set up, is that we think that the sleep apnea essentially acts as a bit of a like a preconditioning to be ready to do the intermittent hypoxia because sleep apnea and for those that don't know sleep apnea is is you know essentially where you have hypoxic episodes regularly during sleep and they stop when when somebody gets woken up or aroused during sleep um so the concept is very similar but that's what he's showing so far but you can imagine that you know it's it's hard to run a clinical trial on this anyway because of the demographics of the the population of spinal cord injury it's even harder to try and get people into the lab to do a sleep study to diagnose levels and severity of sleep apnea and then find the individuals with the right level of sleep apnea to begin to run the intervention on and so your question is an excellent one I, i'm afraid i don't have a better answer for you but yes it would seem that individuals that have the mild to moderate sleep apnea are actually more responsive to intermittent hypoxia whether the sleep apnea acts like intermittent hypoxia we still don't know because we don't understand enough about how controlled the levels of oxygen are during sleep apnea and each sleep apnea episode is different from one another whereas when we deliver the intermittent hypoxia it's very consistent reductions in levels of oxygen we know if the level of oxygen doesn't drop enough, there's no response. We know if it drops too much, then it's it's detrimental to health. So there's really a fine window with where we need to deliver the intermittent hypoxia for it to work. And yeah, we just don't understand enough about each of the episodes of sleep apnea to know if it's coming into the same range, but really good question. Well, thank, thank you for that. Um, further, I, I, I'm C3 stroke four, but I'm incomplete. I have an exercise regime which I, where it's such that I can get myself up to 95 or 100 or so should i be trying holding my breath or breathing into a paper bag whilst doing that yeah it's a good question and uh try it out okay. everybody has different try everybody has different responses to this so honestly like you're your you're your best study participant with some of these things and uh yeah we have tried that with people some have success with it and some don't um but certainly, you know, anything that you can think to do that, what are the other, do you use an abdominal binder? Uh, no, I don't, but I have in the past. Yeah. So, so my whole PhD was actually in abdominal binding, looking at, looking at respiratory function. But what we actually found is that abdominal binders do remarkably good things for your cardiovascular system. And if you're, I'm not sure what exercise you are performing, but if it's mostly upper limb or arm exercise, um, then if you can put an abdominal binder on, it essentially acts as a way to move some of the blood from those blood vessels back up to the heart and improve your heart's response to exercise. So that's also an easy intervention that you could try. And the last uh, question from me before I give way to others is getting, uh, there are various ways that I can get my blood pressure up. Um, is that good exercise for the heart? <laughs> well, Fortunately, my postdoc supervisor, Andrei Krasikov, isn't on this call because I'm not sure he would agree with what I'm about to say as a physiatrist. But but yes, if, uh, uh, you know, if you are able to increase your blood pressure, I will caveat it that it needs to be in a very controlled manner. And sometimes interventions that people choose to use result in uncontrolled episodes of blood pressure. And, and then it becomes a really dangerous situation. So I, I wouldn't say I'm going to condone it. And I would say if you're going to try something like that to do so carefully and and never to do so on your own and always to have somebody, have somebody with you where they can, you know, ideally monitor what your blood pressure is. But yes, people have done that um, with varying degrees of success again. Thank you. 
Um, can I ask if if George, if, if you have a very high level of injury, what are there any ways that you can exercise your heart apart from apart from trying to raise your blood pressure? You know, that's a that's a really good question, and uh, we don't have enough. The easy things to do is, is yes, you can use an abdominal binder that will help to, to put extra stress onto the heart. The other thing is, is um, you can buy uh, small devices called respiratory muscle trainers. Um, so these are devices that you breathe into, not during exercise. You would do this before exercise. Um, so you can breathe into these devices and then you can turn a spring to add resistance and that whilst it targets your respiratory muscles, it really targets your diaphragm. And your diaphragm, if you can make your diaphragm work more effectively, you can actually constrict the main blood vessel going back to the heart with your diaphragm. And so we've been able to do some studies showing that if you can better activate your diaphragm during exercise, then it's essentially a more natural way that you can enhance blood flow back to the heart. So there's many different ones, but if you looked up, you know, respiratory muscle trainers, um, I did some of these studies again in my PhD, there are many forms available in the UK that you can buy for relatively cheap, you know, 20 to 30 pounds. And uh, that will certainly help for respiratory function, but it's also been shown that it can help to promote blood flow back to the heart. Um, and then I don't know about your experiences or access to anything like, you know, functional electrical stimulation. I know there's a lot of centers around the UK that offer that. So I don't know if you've tried that, whether it works for you, but that's certainly another way that you can look to try and promote blood flow back to the heart as well. That's very useful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. Mark? Huh? Oh, Helen's got a question. You're on mute there. Do you want to just come off mute? Got it. I don't have a question. Well, I have a lot of questions, but I'm not going to ask a question. I just want to say thank you so much. First, for all of your dedication and work, and um, also for inviting people who anybody to come join I'm not a I guess I'm not an anybody my son has a, a spinal cord injury uh, complete and um, since his accident three years ago I've been trying to just covering everything I can on spinal research and I've come across everything you've said and I just you're um, Mr. West that was fantastic and um, just explained so much of what I already heard before or read before. And I, I just can't thank all of you enough and everybody in this that is working toward a better life and a, and a possible cure. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. That's some lovely words. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions, if you don't mind, Chris, which, um, I, you know, and I'll keep them short and sweet. Um, so, um, and I think you, you know, I think it kind of is connected to George's question. Um, of course, there are the exercise guidelines that are out there at the moment. And of course, as you, as you know, it's very difficult for tetraplegics to, or quadriplegics for our North American friends, um, to be able to exercise. Um, and, and if you then take a have a if you look at what's going on in perhaps some of the activity based rehab training well these community fitness wellness hubs where they're looking to load the sensory system through kind of standing uh, integrating exercise into you know extension or, or sensory augmentation is there is is there an avenue there to adapt some of those guidelines um, and also try to quantify what some of that sensory stimulus is doing um, for that particular population? Yeah, they're really great questions. And uh, I was I was involved with one of the guideline development ones. There's many different ones that are out there. And yeah. in fact, some new, new ones came out in America recognizing that 
you know, people with high level spinal cord injury don't have the same cardiovascular response. So they're now suggesting it should be 300 minutes of exercise a week, not, you know, 100 to 150, as most of the other guidelines have suggested. I, I don't agree with that view. But um, the question about, you know, how do we or should there be specific guidelines for those with higher injuries and ways to incorporate different technologies into them? there probably should be. And I, I think as we learn more about ways that we can, you know, or interventions that we can utilize to enhance the exercise response, be that sensory stimulation, we don't understand enough about it right now. But um, if you think about what autonomic dysreflexia is, it's a sensory activation that activates the spinal cord below the injury where the circuitry is that goes for heart and blood vessels. So I could for sure see a way where if you could get the, the right type of, um, the right type of cells being sensory cells being activated with those therapies and you can control it, then there would be no reason to believe why you couldn't tap into that, that lower spinal cord circuitry to enhance the exercise response. The, the standing part is, is difficult because you know, with no form of stimulation below the level of the injury, as you saw, like many people with high level injuries, their blood pressure will really drop off. And so um, uh, Andre Krasikov, who was one of my supervisors along the way, actually just finished a really big study in Canada where he was looking at arm exercise versus what we call body weight supported treadmill training exercise. So this would be getting individuals with high level spinal cord injury upright the body weight is supported with a harness and then there are therapists that move the legs in a walking like pattern over the treadmill and uh yeah he measured pretty much every cardiovascular response you could want and there was really no activation of the cardiovascular system with the upright exercise versus just the, the and in fact from the cardiovascular viewpoint the arm exercise was was way better than the the treadmill exercise so but, you know, this isn't an easy answer for the field either, because treadmill exercise has some, you know, some very other important outcomes that, that we want to be following for spinal cord injury. And so how do you how do you incorporate, you know, the different mm -hmm. systems to come up with one guideline, I think, is, is going to be a challenge for the field and something that we have to do a better job of of working towards and studying. So probably not the answer you wanted, but that's that's my take on it right now. No worries. I, I saw a hand. Sandra, was that you? So yeah, that's... sorry. Um, yeah. Can I sorry, can I just clarify what you said? Because uh, I'm I'm lucky enough to have a standing chair, and uh, I uh, often try and exercise. You know, upper uh, I'm T six, um, so I often try to exercise my upper body while standing. But yep. if I understood you correctly, that kind of really makes no difference. Um, if you're T six, it will make a difference because you will have. Again, it just comes back to the level of the injury. Some of those, uh, maybe I can share my screen again, but some of the nerves that are going out to the heart for you are still going to be intact with the brainstem. And so as you stand up, you will be able to mount a normal heart rate response to exercise. What I'm referring to is someone with a cervical spinal cord injury. Mm -hmm. So in that setting, there's no way that the brain can activate that th those circuits within the spinal cord to increase heart rate. So I think for yourself, I could for sure see there being a benefit for you to do some exercise, some arm exercise in your standing frame. Absolutely. For someone with a cervical spinal cord injury, they will face many challenges with their blood pressure dropping too much to be able to accommodate performing exercise in the standing frame. Does that make sense? Does that, does that help clarify? Yeah, yeah thank you. So then yeah, I so I get... wear an, an abdominal binder you're um, following on exactly the right lines of research that that question yeah, well, has never been done to my knowledge nobody has put somebody into or asked someone to go into a standing frame placed an abdominal binder on and then tried to do arm exercise in the upright position i there's a lot of different things happening with that but i think that would be a very interesting concept yep yeah. could i volunteer I mean, just... something sorry sorry to cut across uh, mm -hmm. could i volunteer something which is that over the last month or two um, I've been using a um, a chest monitor uh, so that I can see on the iPad in front of me exactly what my um, heart rate is doing. And I find that is phenomenally useful uh, mm -hmm. in trying to get the uh, heart rate up. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, with 
with smartphones and the technology that's available now, you can buy these heart rate straps or monitors or even, you know, measuring it from the, fi the finger or the thumb, depending on innovation of the hand and, and motor function in the hand are, is also possible as well. So I think there's a lot of work that can be done with incorporating some of these newer technologies into, into some of the exercise studies as well. But thank you for that, that insight. Brilliant. Um, so Helen, did you want to ask something? It looked like. Oh, uh, thank you. What Sandra had asked about uh, T6, would that also apply for T4, 5? Yeah, probably. It's, uh, Get, it's really the mm -hmm. distinction is. The distinction is really the cervical spinal cord. So um, okay. let me let me just quickly share this again. Um, I'm just going to find the slide. Excuse me one second. Um, here it is. It, can you see this slide again now? Yes. Yeah, so it, it really comes down to this. If the, the nerves that control your heart to excite your heart to increase heart rate and the nerves that go to your upper limbs to increase blood pressure, they really start exiting the spinal cord, really T2, mm. T3, T4, T5, T6. Mm. So um, Sandra, for example, if your injury is, is right at T6, then, you know, the, the control center for the cardiovascular system, if you like, the brain of the cardiovascular system sits in this area of the brainstem here. Mm -hmm. So you would have no problem with connections coming down your spinal cord. And I would imagine that if you exercise, your heart rate probably goes up to, you know, 150, 160 if you can exercise hard enough, which would be, you know, essentially yeah. a normal heart rate response to exercise. You know, mm -hmm. conversely, we, we heard from George, and I think he said that you know, his heart rate is usually going up to somewhere around 100 to 110, which would be consistent with what we find. And that's because there's just no activation of, of this area of the spinal cord where these nerves go out to the heart. And so I know it seems like a really small distinction to make between, you know, T6 and, and T1, but actually it, it makes a remarkable difference to the function of the cardiovascular system. And so again, for yourself, standing, arm exercise, you know, you can probably maintain your blood pressure okay in the standing position, but, but someone with a high injury in the cervical mm. cord is really going to struggle with, with maintenance of blood pressure in that position. So the exercise just doesn't become as effective. Um, yeah. Can I just ask um, um, how you recommend that you use an abdominal binder? What, what would you, when would you use it and what would you do with it? Yeah, so so certainly during exercise, and the the ideal way to do it is if you imagine the lower part of the rib cage, you would ideally want a binder that is able to essentially, um, I don't know, people call this like tetra belly, for example, that is able to push the abdomen back so it's in line with the the bottom of the rib cage. You don't want the binder going over the lower part of the rib cage because that will cause a number of challenges with exercise and it can also rub on the rib cage and cause um, damage to the skin in, in insinate areas. But if you're able to put it under the rib cage and above the waist and essentially able to pull it tight enough that you can push the abdominal wall back into line with the rib cage. Um, and then you should use it, you know, you should put it on before exercise, during exercise, and then probably wait 10 to 15 minutes after exercise before removing it. Definitely don't remove it immediately at stopping exercise because if you do, blood will just naturally try and go back into that area and then it's moving away from the heart and brain and, and that can be associated with a, a risk of, of fainting. Brilliant. Lovely. Well, I'm conscious that we've taken lots of Chris's time and it's been a pleasure. really appreciate your a very thorough um, um, insight into your world and work and uh, really appreciate the time spent in making it understandable for us as a community um, because we're not all scientists. Um, and um, yeah, we wish you well. We're really glad to be sponsoring your work as well. So I'm very happy to have you in our portfolio of projects. 
Um, and, um, you know, it's great to see a Brit doing well on the other side of the water. Yeah, thanks so much again. Oops. And uh, yeah, please uh, feel free to reach out if, I, if uh, anyone has any further questions. Yeah. And I just want to thank everyone that's come in today. I know that it's a it's a it's a November autumn evening and I'm sure <laughs> you've got some wee hot toddies um, that you're preparing soon and, and dinner coming up as well. But no, thank you so much for your time. Please do feedback to Andy and Stuart on, on what you thought of the session, what could improve, maybe what you would like to learn about, and we'll see what we can do for the next supporter session. And of course, don't forget, we can't do any of this without you. So, um, you know, whether it's sharing what we do, raising awareness, rabble rousing, speak to your MPs, do absolutely everything you possibly can to make sure the people know that research is underfunded and needs to be supported if we're going to continue to make the progress uh, that we'd like to make. Okay. And, and Chris, just taking you up on, on perhaps getting back if we have further uh, inquiries, mm -hmm. um, is there a way that I, can, like, that I can find your contact details? Yeah, if, uh, I'm, I'm happy, Harvey, if you guys want to share them or it's it's really quite, it's just my name. So chris.west at UBC so University of British Columbia, ubc.ca. Um, but yeah, I'm also happy about Harvey or Suzanne, or you know, if you guys want to just share it out through the, the through email, that's we'll, also we'll, okay. We'll do that for sure. We'll, we'll we'll write up a little bit of a summary and 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 let you guys know. But 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 please do let us know if there's anything else that 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 we can do that we can improve. And of course, um, hopefully we can we can start to grow these meetings out and and learn lots more. Very right. useful. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you. Take care. Thank Have you a great everyone for your Thank time. You everyone. Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Very informative. Thank you very much. Take care, Mark.